we were talking about verses 19 through 22. Verses 19 through 22. And uh, I will just give you a brief review and summary, just in case I didn't go through it thoroughly enough. So what God wants us to know is the last part of verse 19, the working of His mighty power. So He wants us to know the greatness of His power uh, that He has given to us when we believe on Him. If you look at verse 20, that same power is the power that He wrought, He made in Jesus Christ when He raised Him from the dead. It's that same power that resurrected Christ and also can resurrect you in your dead body and take you up to heaven when you get raptured. That's quite a power that God gives to you. That's why we mentioned about the power of prayer, where that kind of resurrection power you gain. So when you speak, you're speaking resurrection rapture power, the power to travel through outer space. That's mighty. And set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So that same power is what put Jesus up at the right hand up in heaven above outer space. So thus, I meant what I said about time traveling. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. So remember that same power that put Jesus Christ traveling through outer space up to the right hand up in heaven is above every principality, that's rulership, kingdom, and power, any power that you can think of, governmental, strength, or rulership, and might, anyone that is mighty in ability, and dominion, so that's a terrain that you rule as a king, and every name that is named, it's above any name that you can think of, Mohammed, Buddha, uh, the Pope, etc. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come, so it's this power that put Jesus Christ up in the heavens is above everything else, not only in this world that you can think of, but everything in future worlds as well. So that's where we come down to verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet. So everything, principality, power, might, dominion, name that is name, everything is underneath the feet of Jesus Christ. So he's stepping on all those things. So basically, you got to understand this, that Jesus Christ, he steps over the United States, he steps over uh, Korea, he steps over Russia, he steps over China, he steps over Muhammad, he steps over Buddha, he's, he's walking on top of them. Basically, he's saying, kiss my feet to everyone in the world. So they're all below his feet. If you look at the book of Isaiah, the last chapter, chapter 66, uh, if I recall from my memory, the Bible says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my what? Footstool. That's why the world, everything in this world is below his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things. So Jesus Christ is head over everything. Everything in, in what? Verse 21. Verse 20. Resurrection power, traveling to outer space. Everything in this world or in future worlds, all is underneath the head of Jesus Christ. He's above it. He's head over it. But notice, this is the part that I told you last time, head over all things to the what? Church, you gain that power. Jesus Christ, he's head over all those things, but he gives that to the church. That's mighty in power. That's mighty in strength. That's the, what I'm talking about at verse 19 there. God wants us to know the exceeding greatness of his power. And he gave it to you. You have it in you, but you just need to claim it. You need to pray for it. That's, that's how powerful prayer is. That's why I mentioned to you before I did a video where prayer practically pretty much just changes or bends the laws of nature itself. That's how powerful it is. Now, verse 23, now we can go verse by verse and explain more detail here which is his body. That's important. Did you notice that? So the church is not a building. Do you understand that? So, okay, this is out of ink. It gave up the ghost. It's, it's dead. So the church is known to be the body of Jesus Christ. Then that means that the church is not a building. Do you understand that? 
The church is not a building. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. So thus, when the government shuts down churches, to be quite honest, they're not shutting down churches. They're only shutting down the buildings where we meet. Churches, it'll still come alive. During COVID-19, we never shut down church. Only the building was temporarily shut down, but we gathered in other places. We did it through online. But the church is basically the body of Jesus Christ. So basically, churches nearly every second of your life. Do you realize that? Amen. Because all of you are a part of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ never leaves you, nor do you ever leave Jesus Christ. You're a part of His body. So churches every day. So I wonder if we see the good Christian you not just in a building, but in every day. You only behave well in church. And when I say in church, I'm saying a building here. So that's when you only behave, huh? When I say you should behave well in church, that should mean every second of your life, even the privacy of your own bedroom and what you do with your own cell phone that you don't want other people to see. Or to the very down to the private thoughts where you're thinking about somebody that you don't want them to find out. So whenever I draw the church over here, I only do it for picture, picture purposes. Church should be known only as a picture thing at, when it's known to be a building. It shouldn't be known realistically that way. The church should actually be the body of Jesus Christ himself, not a building. Now, you're going to hear preachers piously say, you know, in the house of God, we don't do that at church. And we, sh we do reverence in the house of God in church. But that's all pious statements. That's actually, it should be done nearly every day of your life. Nearly every day of your life. That's church, not only in a building. So guess what? If they shut down our buildings, it's not the end of the world for us. We're still going to have church no matter what. You know that? Amen. We're still going to have church no matter what, even if they shut down the buildings. Why? Because the church is his body. It always moved on. Now, notice over here that the church is known to be the body of Jesus Christ. And this is where you got to watch out for those hyper-dispensationalists. Some of them teach that there are actually two bodies of Christ, or two churches, so to speak. So, not two bodies of Christ. Basically, it's known as there are two bodies or two different churches. But they believe one is specifically, specifically the Pauline revelation, where he reveals the body of Jesus Christ. And then some hyper-dispensationalists, they'll say the other church where it mentions about Jews, it would be referring to Jews and Gentiles joining one body together. Now that is very weird. Now you might wonder why would they teach something like that. The reason why is because mid-Acts, grace churches, who are also known as hyper-dispensationalist churches, they are, very, they are very obsessed with Paul. Because now this sounds like dispensational. So onliners should watch out for these guys. Just because they call themselves dispensationalists doesn't mean that they're genuine dispensationalists. They could be part of the hyper-dispensational cult. So let me try to make this simple for you. So the Mid-Acts Church believed that there, some of them believe that there are two bodies because they have to do it this way. When you try to prove that the church started at Acts chapter 2, the mid-Acts people, they're going to deny that. That's why they're called mid-Acts. What does that mean? In the middle of Acts is when the church started. No, that don't sound right. It sounds like way back at Acts 2. The reason why they insist that it's in the middle of Acts the church started is because of Paul. They're all looking at Paul. Now, let me know if I'm out of bounds because I have no idea. Paul, remember... The revelation he gives is church age doctrine. We all agree with that, yes? Yeah, we all agree with that it's church age doctrine. If it wasn't for Paul, then we would be studying Jewish doctrines, whether they're tribulation or Old Testament. So I'm not going to review that with you. You all know dispensationalism. 
Because of Apostle Paul, that's where we get church doctrine. This is where hyper-dispensationalists get it wrong. Because they insist Paul has church age doctrine, hence the church has to start with Paul. That way they can clean it off nicely from the Jews. So Jewish doctrine was finished right here, and starting from here is where we get Christian doctrine. But that is so not true, because the Bible says at Acts chapter 2, that's when the church started. It says church. Look at the last verse of Acts 2. It says church, right? So then what are you going to do about that? So you can't say the church started with Paul. Obviously not. The church started long before Paul. Paul, he was responsible for giving church age Christian doctrine. That's what he was responsible for. But it doesn't mean the church started with Paul. There were Jews in the church at Acts 2, and then later on it became more and more Gentile. Remember that? That's what we teach. We teach this. The church started at Acts 2, which was primarily Jews, but it was transitioning to Gentiles. That's what we teach. See, because of that, that's why there's a mingling of Jewish or Gentile doctrine when it involves with the church. That's why, for example, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it talks about the church, the church, seven churches, right? But it has a mingling of Jewish doctrine as well as Christian church doctrine. That's non-Jewish. That's why there's a mingling of that. You look through Hebrews through the book of Jude. It's Jewish tribulation doctrine, but at the book of the epistles of John, it mentions church. So it has some non-Jewish doctrine in there. So hyper-dispensationalists, I guess that's too deep for them or whatever. So what they want to do instead of like transitioning, they divide it. That's why they're hyper-dispensationalists. They overtly divide. They want to divide this, but you can't divide it because when you read the book of Acts, it says the church started there and there's a lot of Jewish doctrine in there. So you, you can't divide it that way, especially when God turns to the Gentiles there's still some Jewish thing over there. So you can't do that. But the hyper-dispensationalists, they have to divide it. That way it's easier for them, see? It's easier for them. That's why I keep telling you, hyper-dispensationalists, they're not deeper dispensationalists. They're actually lazier dispensationalists. Hyper-dispensationalists, because transitioning of Jewish and Gentile mingling is too deep for them. They want to nicely clean it off. That way they can insist everything is Jewish over here right, right. and the rest is Pauline or church age Christian. So how are they going to successfully do this when church starts at Acts 2? That's why they say mid-Acts over here. So then this is, where they this is where they do church splits. You ready for this? This is hilarious. These hyper-dispensationalists, they do church splits. This is their whole gospel. They make it a, a big issue if you don't do Acts 10 or if you don't go to uh, Acts chapter 28 or far along up to Ephesians right here. So guess what? The hyper-dispensationalists, they're, they're dividing among each other too. They, they debate each other. They write articles debating each other just on that. <laughs> you know why? Because... If you go to Acts 10 and start the church there, guess what? You're still going to see some Jewish doctrine there. So that doesn't work their system nicely. Because we have to end the Jew somewhere. Where are we going to end the Jew? Let me, sh let me show you where you can end the Jew. Ready? You can't when you look at this. They're all mingled. They're all mingled. You can't do that. It was a transition. Only God knows when he officially ended it. Now, Acts 10, you can't do that, so they do Acts 28. But they can't do that either, so that's why they go as far as Ephesians. Now, can you believe that? God started the Christian church all the way at Ephesians. That's too much, right? That's why they insist that the, uh, when the Bible mentions church at Acts 2 or etc., it's referring to a different church or a different body, which is... So see, the Jews have their nice little church and body. The Gentiles also, wherever you start at 10, 28, or Ephesians, or wherever you want to start it, that's this other church, which is known as the body of Christ, which is where we're at. But they, don't, but they divide on where to start.
very simple. If you look at basic dispensationalism, you can't, uh, you can't find an official ending point of a time period. It all transitions in each other's in all these ages. Why would God do that? Do I have to repeat again? Because God, he's, it's the same thing he does with you. When you don't listen to him like the Jews don't, God switches over to a different person or a different program and says, okay, I'm giving you up and I'm going to use another person. But he doesn't cut you off like that. He slowly, he's transitioning from you to there, from you to the other person. Why? Because he's merciful to you. He's giving you a chance to repent and come back. That's why God didn't cut you off like this immediately. He was transitioning and gradually cutting off from you and going to a different person. Do you see that in your personal walk with Jesus Christ? That's why you need to get back on track. That's why the Jews, they had every chance in the world. God's giving them a chance, see? All right, so then what are we going to do about these uh, two churches and two bodies that some hyper-dispensationalists might say? Now, you notice I keep saying some. People get mad and say, these mid acts people get mad and say, mid acts don't teach that. Yeah, probably you're the only one that don't believe it. You know why I say that? Because they're all dividing each other on what should be, when the church should start, or what they define a body and a church and etc. <laughs> That's why I keep saying some hyper-dispensationalists, some mid acts because I don't know what all of them believe, because they all believe differently. But basically, the point is this. The point is, is that, no, we believe that this is one and the same thing. It's not divided, all right? They're the same church. So how do we prove that? Let's look at chapter 2, Ephesians 2. Notice at what, when the body started at verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the what? By the cross. Did you notice that? So notice that the body of Jesus Christ is started at Calvary. It started at Calvary. That's when the body of Christ started. In Acts 2, because uh, church is officially mentioned there, and they officially start with the Holy Spirit pouring down, that's why we'll say Acts 2 is when it officially started. But the actual starting point is the cross. The actual starting point is the cross. Officially, where it was full-fledged and having the Holy Spirit, we'll say Acts 2. So then, what do you do with that one? So they have to divide this one. So they divide, the, they divide it. Uh, some of them will divide Ephesians 2, 16. This body from the Pauline body at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 through 23. See how wacky they get into? Why? Because it ruins their nice little picture that they have here. Because they have to cut off a Jew and Gentile some point. Now, you know why that's ridiculous? I'll tell you why that's ridiculous. One, you're looking at the same author here who's talking about the church. You think he pictured two different churches? That's one. Number two... Notice that the context, context is important, right? 22 through 23, the body of Christ, the church, when did that start? Look at, it's based on what? It's based on verse 7. In whom we have redemption, what? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay. Look at chapter 2 and verse 16. Is that the same body or is that a different body? It's the same body. You know why it's the same at verse 16? Just go backwards at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the what? Oh, so notice that the Ephesians 1 body, okay, the Ephesians, uh, this is so confusing. These hyper dispensationalists can sometimes be more confusing. Yeah. So some of them, I'm not saying all, but some of them want to distinguish the Ephesians 1 body from the Ephesians 2 body. So remember that, right? Remember that's what they want to do? Because they want to insist that the Pauline revelation to the body of Christ to Gentiles, it has to be different from Jewish. It has to be totally different from Jewish. So anything that mentions church or body of Christ to a Jew, 
They want to try to separate that to a different body or church. That's why when you look at Revelation 2 and 3, those churches, they want to think of those as Jewish churches. They want to try to separate that. Now, I, I agree with them. They have something right because it's the book of Revelation is tribulation. There's no doubt it's tribulation churches. But my goodness, you can't deny church age doctrine that can match with some of those verses over there. You can't deny that. So it's mingle again. It's mingle. All right, so returning back over here, Ephesians 1 body of Christ is supposed to be different from the Ephesians 2 body of Christ. No, because notice I colored them in red. They're all based on what? The blood of Jesus Christ. So guess what? It goes back to where? Right here. Again, the body of Christ then started where? At the cross. You can't go around that. Watch out for these mid-acts, guys. Hyper-dispensationalists. They want to say that the book of John, chapter 3, ye must be born again, that that was something Jewish. That was not Christian church. You've got to watch out for these guys. They're very dangerous people. You say, why are they dangerous? It doesn't make a difference. Yes, it does. You know why? Any Christian verse that you find that, that is God's promise to you, they steal that from you and say, no, that's for a Jew. That's why. Watch out for these guys. They'll rob you of your blessing. Whenever you keep hearing a, a teacher saying, our Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul, mid-Acts, or the body of Christ started in the middle of Acts, not at the beginning, but the middle of Acts, they're hyper-dispensational. All right? So watch out for these guys.